Well, welcome everybody. Just glad you're here today. And as we continue our uh, teaching and our discussion on uh, the, the Forerunner School class, the Life School class called A Theology of the Bride. Uh, and we're kind of coming toward the, the end of the, of the class. I mean, probably if you've been with us from the beginning, you're wondering if we'll ever finish. And uh, this is session 13, and we have uh, session, we have 15 sessions all together. So uh, yeah, there is a quite an extensive class, I, I, I know. One, one of the things that I've tried to do with this class is to uh, just really put in writing everything that I know about uh, Christ as our bridegroom king and our, our uh, relationship to him as his bride and the need to make ourselves ready uh, as a bride for him. For I, I really believe this is one of the, one of the if not the most important um, actions that we can do as a believer once we are born again, and that is to go through that sanctification process so as to be made ready uh, as a bride for Christ. The, the bride made ready will accomplish several things. One, it will be the event that transitions the church from uh, the church age uh, to the kingdom age. It's the event that will trigger the second coming of Christ. Well, he'll be coming as a triumphant king uh, and he'll also be coming as a bridegroom, coming to uh, bring about the consummation of the marriage relationship. And the bride, from that point on, will be the eternal partner of Christ uh, throughout the millennial age and then throughout the ages, all the ages to come. So it's a very important issue that as believers uh, that we learn to make ourselves ready as a bride uh, and then as forerunners, that, uh, th that we realize that as a voice and as a builder, uh, we're, we're really friend we need to be friends of the bridegroom. We need to uh, really speak bride bridal paradigm, bridal readiness uh, into the life of the church. Otherwise, um, the church won't make themselves ready uh, as a bride. One, session 15, which will be in a couple sessions down the road here. We're going to deal with this whole uh, issue of really focusing as a believer, focusing our life on making ourselves ready as a bride. It's a very important issue and, and, uh, and, and so many believers uh, have no real insight into that whatsoever. And forerunners are needed to, to be that voice, to keep, keep it before the people uh, week after week, month after month, uh, so that they really understand the importance of it, and not only just the importance of it, but how to really uh, dig in to that readiness uh, aspect. Because as you know, we've dealt with this from the very beginning of the, of the class, that when the bride has made herself ready, that's when the Lord will return. So it's a very important class, uh, and... This, the, this session and the next session are very uh, important as well. This session is entitled, uh, session 13, and it's entitled, Come Out of Her, My People. Come Out of Her, My People, uh, part one, uh, based on uh, Revelation 17 and 18, and specifically Revelation 18, verse 4. And we'll, we'll read that in just a minute. Uh, and then the next session will be session 14, obviously, and it will be Come Out of My People, Part 2. Uh, and so we're going to deal in this session. There, there's two aspects of, of this. Uh, there, and there's coming out of a, a, allegiance with the uh, mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great, the great harlot, coming out of an allegiance with her, uh, we'll deal with in this session. And then in the next session, we're going to deal with come out of the sins of the Babylonian uh, system. And so allegiance in this session and the sins of that in the next. Very important uh, because as you look at, as you look at Revelation uh, 17, 18, and then on through the end of the book of Revelation, what you see is you see this great contrast uh, between 
the bridal city, the new Jerusalem, and the bride who has been, who's made herself ready, and this uh, harlot uh, city, uh, you know, harlot bride or uh, harlot woman, uh, who is a complete opposite of the bride made ready. There's a contrast. And so for the bride to be made ready, for the bride to be made ready, uh, to be dressed in those linen garments, to be made ready, the righteousness, the concrete expression of righteousness, she has to come out of this harlot system uh, as, as well as go into the preparation of the bridal relationship. So, uh, so very important. Uh, these, these two sessions are very uh, important. And really the one we're going to be talking about uh, today, come out of allegiance with this system, uh, could be a, a life or death system, even related to, to uh, avoiding taking the mark of the beast. So uh, anyway, so very important. Now I want to pray and then we'll, we'll jump into the scriptures and jump in to this, and hopefully I've got your attention, and hopefully I will have it. Uh, we want to really uh, understand these really, really vital truths here. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for uh, this session, and Lord, I know that I am unable to really communicate with accuracy uh, and clarity everything that needs to be communicated, but I know that you are able, and you're in me, and so I ask that you would just take me out of the way as I'm merely an earthen vessel. You're the treasure. And so I ask that you would speak boldly and clearly so that we could come out of allegiance and come out of the sins of the Babylonian system. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Um, okay, let's start. Well, what I want to do, I'm going to start first by doing a, a brief contrast between the bridal city, the New Jerusalem, uh, and the harlot uh, city. So let me just read uh, a little bit from Revelation, starting with Revelation 17. So the, the harlot is described in Revelation 17 and 18, and then beginning with 19, then we go into the understanding of the actual bride and the bridal city and the bride made ready and a lot of things uh, related uh, to that. Um, and so let's start with, with Revelation 17, verse 1. And it says this, And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls uh, came and spoke with me and said, Come, and I will show you the, the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Uh, remember that verse, that harlot sits on many waters. With whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious uh, stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cu cup full of abominations. We'll look at that in the next session. And of the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead a name was written, a, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. So that's kind of an overview of this uh, harlot woman called uh, Mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great, uh, the harlot, the, the, the mother of harlotries and the mother of all abom abominations. And so we'll, we'll look at more of that as we get into this. But then let's go to 18 now. Let me read this scripture because this is the, the call upon us, uh, starting with verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality and, of the, and, the, kings, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth 
of her sensuality. And in verse 4 here, this is what I want to get to. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity, and pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to the deeds, the cup which she has mixed, twice as much for her. And of course we could go on. But we see this, this strong exhortation, because this is an angel with great authority, comes to John, the Apostle John, and he says, come out of her, come out of her, my people. In other words, come out of all uh, involvement with this Babylon the Great, the mystery Babylon, the, uh, the great harlot, the mother of harlots, the mother of the abominations of the earth. Come out of her. And if the bride is going to be made ready, because and we know this because the very next chapter, the bride has made herself ready. The Babylon, the, the great Babylon falls. Babylon the great falls. The bride has made herself ready. But you see this great contrast between the bride, the bridal city, the bride made ready, and this great harlot. And so we have to come out of the harlot system, out of the, Babylon, the Babylonian system, and into the bridal relationship if we're going to be a part of the bride made ready. Uh, so let's look at this, let's look a little bit more de in a little bit more depth into who this harlot Babylon, Babylon the Great, uh, is. If you'll, if you know, if you'll notice. And we'll, we'll look at the scriptures there. Well, first let me say this. In contrast to God's eternal plan, Satan is raising up a great harlot as a counterfeit to oppose people from becoming a prepared bride. Now, that, and I, hopefully I made that point a minute ago, but I want to make it sure we understand this. The harlot system, the Babylon the Great, that which we have to come out of, part of that, Satan has a, a plan to bring up a counterfeit, a, a complete opposite of the bridal uh, paradigm, the bridal city, the bridal relationship uh, that, the, that believers are to be in. And the, the point of it is to, po to oppose people and to seduce them, to come against them from being made ready as a bride. So it's very important that we come out uh, of that system. Now remember in this session we're dealing with coming out of an allegiance with, the ba with Babylon the Great. In the next session we'll talk about coming out of the sins of Babylon uh, the Great. If we look at Revelation 17 and 18 there seems to be three dimensions of Babylon the Great. Three dimensions. First there is a governmental a governmental aspect to this. There, there, is a, there is a governmental system there. One of the things that we believe, and you know, one, one of the things that Brian and I talk about uh, quite a bit is and when you're looking at these end time things, you have to hold your opinions and your views loosely because, you know, we're looking at the future and as we look at the future, sometimes things that seem so correct Today, you know, some event will happen in a month from now and it seems like, well, what we did believe isn't really right. So we hold it loosely. But what we believe is this, this uh, Babylon the Great, the mystery Babylon, is most likely the seventh kingdom at, that is spoken of in Revelation 17. You know, we've dealt with that in other uh, sessions where you know, the different uh, nations that came against Israel, uh, Rome being the one that was, had come against Israel at the time of the writing, the 6-1. And then the Revelation 17 says that there's a seventh one coming, and then the Antichrist one, which will be the eighth. And we believe this Babylon the Great most likely is a description of this seventh kingdom. Uh, and there are three dimensions of this. Uh, there's a governmental 
uh, dimension. There's an economic division, and there's a religious uh, aspect of it as well. So let's look at the governmental part of it as well. If you look at Revelation 17, verse 18, it says, And the woman who you saw is the great city, the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, most likely, uh, almost certainly, because when John wrote this, Rome was the great city. So pretty sure that the, the Rome is the city that he's talking about. But it's more than just a city. It's a real large movement, uh, somewhat of a global movement. Maybe not a totally a global movement, but certainly over multiple nations. Because if you look at... Um, Revelation 17, 1, you see that the harlot sits on many waters. And then if you look at Revelation 17, 15, you, say, you, you said, it says, He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we don't know how large this geographical area will be. Um, I mean, most, a lot of the theologians say, and I believe this, that it refers to probably a revived Roman Empire of sorts, which would include many nations, uh, you know, much of Europe, the European Union, much of Europe, and uh, who, who knows? I mean, the, the rise of this kingdom would probably attempt to control the whole earth. Whether that will be the case or not would be yet to be determined, probably, most likely not. Uh, but it's a global, I'll, I'll just use this term, it's a global city. It's a, it's a, it's a large uh, place. It may have a, it probably will have a capital, which may be Rome or it may be multiple capitals. I mean, it could even be an economic capital, a religious capital, and a governmental capital of the three dimensions of this city. I don't know. But the point, I don't think where it is is as important as the fact that it's a city over many waters that affects uh, many people and nations. So there's a governmental aspect to it. And again, remember that it's, it's Babylonian in the sense that it wants to uh, take the people of God captive. Just think of Daniel for a minute, that during the, the days of Daniel, uh, Israel was, was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and, and were, many of the people were taken into Babylonian captivity, Daniel being one, one of those who was taken into captivity and enslaved there and put under the Babylonian system. Uh, and so a lot of what when we say come out of her, which we're, we're, what we're saying is we're, we're living in the midst of it, just like Daniel was, but we have to be in the system without being of the system. Uh, and so we have to not come into allegiance with this. I mean, there could be uh, some people where the Lord speaks to them and says, get out of, uh, if say Europe, for example, get out of Europe and come and live in a, in a safer place. I, I don't know. If that will happen or not, you know, I think it po quite possibly could. But for most of us, we're, we'll live where we live, but we can't be of that system. We can't come into allegiance of that system. And so let's look again now at the governmental aspect of it. Again, we don't know exactly how this is going to come through, but this is kind of what we sense at this point in time. If you go back to... Uh, a, a number of years ago, the UN uh, came up with what they call the 2030 Agenda with 17 Goals of Sustainable Development. Uh, and you look at these and you read these and they sound really, really good. You know, I'll just read kind of quickly through some of them, maybe all of them. No poverty, this is the 17 goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, uh, quality education, gender, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth. Uh, uh, I'll just skip over some of these. Responsible consumption and production, climate action, 
Uh, anyway, there, there's 17 of them. And when you read through them, you think, man, who could, who could disagree with that? Uh, this all sounds good. It, I mean, everybody would love to see no poverty in the earth. Everybody would love to see zero hunger, good health and well-being. All of, we'd all want those things, but uh, what we sense is that this is a blueprint of a global initiative to bring as much of the world, maybe all of the world would be the, their intent, under the control of a, of a global leadership uh, who would control every aspect of life. Uh, l let's just, um, well, let me just say this. So that's the, the UN had this agenda. And then, you know, agencies like the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and other organizations are setting up specific initiatives to implement these 17 uh, global initiatives. Uh, and then nations in, in this global coalition, nations are then uh, implementing policies and laws and rules to implement uh, these things. Uh, you know, just here's, a, here's an example of what, you know, you see one of the initiatives is good health and well-being. Good health and well-being. Now, everybody wants good health and well-being. But one of the things that's going on right now, whether it'll pass, hopefully it won't, but whether it'll pass or not is yet to be determined. But there's a meeting, I understand, in May of 2023, where, and by the time you hear this, watch this, it may have uh, already been happened and may have passed or may not have passed. But the World, uh, the World Health Organization, there's a vote going on to whether to give the World Health Organization control over, uh, the poss uh, over how to deal with future pandemics to, so that they would have sovereignty, global sovereignty for every nation who agrees to this over global pa pandemics. Uh, and they could force vaccines, they could force uh, you know, isolation and uh, shutting down of churches. They could afford, they could force all sorts of things for those nations who agree to it. Now, I know in America, uh, one of the things that has happened is that there seems to be an approval in our uh, democratic government to want to go along with that. So the United States is seceding uh, their uh, could, sovereignty, their, their national sovereignty to a global organization that would do things that would be inconsistent with uh, many things and quite possibly inconsistent with the bride being made ready. So, there, and you know, each one of these could have a f similar types of impact. And so how it will all work out, I don't know. But what the Lord wants us to do is come out of allegiance with those things that would give control to people who would take us away from our, the freedom to love and obey our Lord uh, with freedom and with uh, the ability to do it as he so leads us to be. In other words, it's a taking away of our personal freedom. So anyway, that's the government aspect of it. And, you know, I'm not trying to give a absolute clear uh, way this will come forth in this way. I'm trying to present a general principles and a way and give you enough illustrations so that you can kind of see how it possibly could work out so that you can have discernment on how to deal uh, with these things. So... And we're going to deal with Dan, the, the Daniel here in just a minute. So anyway, the first way it manifests is in, in a governmental way. Uh, the second way, second aspect of it is that there's an economic uh, uh, component to the system, economic and poss quite possibly a, 
uh, effect on the, monitor, the global monetary system. Uh, just some of the, uh, the, there's three scriptures. Let me just read these three verses of scripture related to the, the, the Babylon the Great's economic uh, control or attempt to control economically. For all the nations have drunk, this is uh, Revelation 18.3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants, merchants of the earth, have become rich by the wealth, the wealth of her sensuality. So we see a kind of an economic aspect of that. And then 1811, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes. Anymore. Again, we see an economic aspect, although this is after she has fallen. And then in Revelation 18, 15, the merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping, and mourning. Um, and then here's a quote from Robert Thomas. He has a great uh, two-volume commentary on the book of Revelation that we've quoted a number of times here. But he, he writes this, the distinction between the two chapters, uh, chapter 17 and 18, is that between these two systems or networks, there have been, uh, that have the same geographic headquarters. In chapter 17 is a religious system that operates independently of and in, in opposition to the true God. So I like that, what he said that operates independently of and, and in opposition to God, the true God. But in chapter 18, it is an economic system that does the same, an economic system that does uh, the, the same. Uh, and so, you know, it's, we don't know exactly how that, all that will manifest, but we do know that one of the things that, are, that is going on now uh, is, uh, you know, in, in terms of America, the, the, a lot of talk about taking the dollar away as the global uh, petrodollar and it related to the purchase of oil globally and things like that. Uh, but probably even more ominous would be the, the move towards a digital currency. Because if, we, if the world goes to some form of a global or regional digital currency, say controlled by some of the central banks or whatever, if it goes to that, then this would give, potentially would give uh, people the authority to determine what we can buy or sell. Uh, you know, if we don't meet their criteria, uh, you know, religious or otherwise, uh, they could cut off our ability to go into certain stores or, or to use our money as they would have complete control and they would have complete they would have potentially complete understanding of how we spend our money so there's an economic aspect uh, to this uh, as well again the Lord is saying come out of allegiance with this especially as it is in opposition to the the things of God and then the third, aspect of it is that there is a religious component uh, to the system which is adamantly opposed to true Christianity. There's a religious aspect of that. Uh, again, let me just read a quote from uh, Thomas in his commentary on Revelation. It said, it, it is indicative of her spiritual harlotry and representative of an e ecclesiastical or religious facet that is a counterfeit of the real, of the real. In prophetic language, prostitution, fornication, or adultery is equivalent to idolatry or religious apostasy. And here's what he said. He, she leads the world in pursuit of false religion, whether it be paganism or perverted religion. Uh, so what we see in terms of the religious aspect of this is that it could be uh, a movement globally, you, you know, and they could be connected to the economic control and the governmental control as well that has a religious component to it that would force 
the church not to be able to hold to its true biblical uh, values, to the, to the truths of the scriptures. Now, we don't know exactly how it's going to unfold, but, you know, we, we see certain things happening. You know, one thing that uh, I thought of as I was preparing to speak about this is that, you know, Terry Bennett had that 21-year prophecy about uh, 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 the economic issues starting with 2008, seven-year period of that, which certainly uh, had a huge effect there. The governmental uh, turmoil and upheaval from 2000, I think, 15 to 22, uh, which certainly uh, really took place and is still going on. And then the third one was a religious uh, seven-year period beginning in 20, uh, I think, at uh, Rosh Hashanah 2022. So that's, we're just kind of beginning in that seven, that third seven-year cycle. So we'll see how it unfolds. But there is that movement and we don't know how it, it will unfold, but it could be the joining of the three uh, monotheistic religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity into a common way. I mean, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in, the, in a lot of the elite and a lot of the movement there toward, a, toward climate change, and it could be even to the worship of the earth it could be tied into this. Um, or it could be just, uh, you know, paganism or, or what's happening, what, you know, we see happening right now uh, is just a lot of compromise in, the, in the, 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 what we would call the real church, uh, the, the ones who hold to Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. A lot of compromise going on there. Uh, even, you know, in some, and there's a huge movement, even hitting in evangelical circles now in, in America uh, to allow, uh, you know, homosexual uh, pastors to, I mean, people to be ordained as pastors, homosexual marriage, and a, and a lot of other things. And, and it's going well beyond that. And we'll deal with some of that in the, uh, in the next session. Uh, so anyway, there are three aspects Three aspects of this um, this uh, Babylonian system, the, har the the great harlot, the Babylon the great, the great harlot, and we have to come out of allegiance to this, as it says in Revelation eighteen four. Come out of her, my people. Uh, so modern day Babylon, uh, modern day Babylon will use these three areas of government the economy and slash monetary system and religion to ensnare people into its harlot system. And so the bride has to resist these things, resist being in allegiance uh, with these movements. And so it's going to take a lot of real discernment on the heart of the bride to know, okay, what is this thing is trying to be forced on the people of the earth. What's really behind this? Uh, you know, I've kind of gotten to the point, if, the go if our government in America really pushes and said, this is really good for you, this is good for you, we really want you to do this, we really want you to do this, you need to do this, what I begin to think is, okay, what's their real plan? And I'm saying, I don't want to do, do that. If they say do it, I'm not, my initial reaction is that I'm going to resist it, or at least, uh, it, it, at least, evaluate it and see, try to determine, okay, what's the real motive there? But this system, they're going to use these three major components to come against, uh, come against the, the, the people to ensnare them into this Babylonian system. So let's look at, Dan, the, the, let's look at the, the, the book of Daniel. Um, I don't know that I'll actually turn there, but I want to talk about several things about Daniel. So most of this you should be familiar with the scriptures. But you know, Daniel was taken along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and others uh, out of Israel, out of Jerusalem probably, out of Jerusalem into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered Babylon. So he is a picture uh, of the leader 
of Babylon. Of course, we're talking about Babylon the Great, Mystery Babylon, the coming forth of another type of Babylon with the same similar types of characteristics. So he took them into Babylonian captivity. Uh, but what Daniel did, and his friends as well, is they, they resisted being in allegiance with the Babylonian system when that system led them or tried to get them to uh, deny their God or to come against their God or to come to compromise their walk with the Lord. And we have to be the, we have to be the same way. If we're going to be the bride made ready, we have to learn to live that way. Now, especially as all this is coming up, even in our day, we have to learn to live as Daniel did in Babylon. Now, you know, it starts out in, in Daniel chapter 1. You know, you know the story. Uh, they took, Nebuchadnezzar brought Daniel and his three friends and, among, uh, and others, and they were trying to incorporate them into the Babylonian system. They wanted them to learn all the literature and, the, and all the uh, languages of Babylon. They wanted to, uh, to get them to eat the, the food of the king and drink his wine and, and all of those things. And they were trying to really, what they were trying to do is they were trying to uh, take away their, their uh, Jewish identity and enmesh it into a Babylonian uh, identity. They were trying to change them and then to make them where they were, uh, could be used in this Babylonian society. And so, you know, there's a lot more to it, but Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter one that Daniel determined or resolved in his heart that he was not going to take uh, the king's food, because it, it was a, a couple of reasons there. One, it was a violation of the Jewish dietary law. So he would have to, he would have to compromise his walk as it related to the law. But even, uh, not, not necessarily more so, but in, in addition to that, the food that, 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 the king, that was at the king's table had, or, had been sacrificed to the Babylonian gods like Marduk uh, and Ishtar. It was sacrificed to them, and the king would eat though that food, that meat sacrificed to those idols. He would eat that because he would believe that that would invoke the favor of those Babylonian gods. And he was wanting Daniel and his friends to eat that food because that would incorporate them into a form even of worship of the Babylonian gods. And Daniel said, uh, you know, I'm not going to do it. He determined in his heart. Now, it all worked out with the king. He, the Lord uh, allowed him to, or the, yeah, the Lord allowed him to go through a test and pass that test. And he was allowed to do it. But he had determined, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to compromise my faith uh, in order to do what might seem to a lot of people to be something like, oh, don't worry about it. It's not worth your life. He's just saying, you know, it's, it's not about denying your God. It's just about eating some food and, you know, about violating a little bit of, uh, of your faith as it relates to uh, your, uh, you know, your dietary laws and your scriptures. So it's not really denying Christ. It's just maybe a little bit of compromise, not worth dying over. Uh, so people would think that way. Probably a lot of them did think that way. But that's when we start talking about come out of allegiance, we have to be careful because it, there's a progressive uh, movement toward restricting people's walk and, and forcing them to come out of one thing after another to ultimately, it's going to be illegal to be a conservative Christian. It could very well lead there. Uh, Eric Metaxas wrote a book to the American church talking and comparing what's going on right now in America uh, with what took place in Nazi Germany uh, where the church just 
compromise, small compromise after small compromise. And they ended up uh, really basically having to deny their, uh, their true faith uh, in God. So we see this with Daniel. It's, it's a progressive. First started out with a dietary situation, but then, you know, there came the time with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where, uh, you know, Daniel had had this, or, or Nebuchadnezzar had had this dream, and Daniel shared the dream, and then he interpreted it for Nebuchadnezzar. And he talked about a head of gold, which was Nebuchadnezzar, and then silver and bronze, et cetera, and iron. So Nebuchadnezzar, being the prideful king that he was, he made a whole statue out of gold. He said, I'm going to forget about these other uh, countries. I'm going to make the whole statue out of gold. And so, and he said, at the dedication, I think the thing was like 90 feet tall or something. It was huge. And so he was saying, at the dedication of this statue, Everybody has to, when the horn is blown, everybody has to bow down and worship at it. And if you don't, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, didn't, they decided they weren't going to bow down to it. Uh, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Uh, thankfully, you know, God uh, was with them, and there was a fourth man in there with them, and that was Christ. With them, and he saved them uh, from that, and they're buying, they got a promotion because of that. Uh, and then there's a third one, third encounter, where Daniel, where, where the, 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 the people in charge uh, said, Look, we got to get Daniel, and we can't, there's nothing we can, he, he walks in integrity, he's done, he does a good job with everything. The only thing we can get him on is that we can make a law that prohibits him uh, from, worship, from remaining faithful to his God and forces him to worship uh, the, uh, the, the king. And so they make this law, and of course Daniel refuses, and he's tossed into the lion's den. Uh, and again, God saves him uh, from that. And so what we see is a progression to where the point where laws are there to force people uh, to, to comply with, these, with this Babylonian system. And the same thing, we're in the same place now uh, at the beginning of the beginnings, but we're in that same place, kind of like Daniel in chapter 1, where there's been a you know, an attempt to, to force people to compromise. But it's not going to end there. And so the Lord is saying, I believe the Lord is saying, as, as we come out of Babylon, come out of allegiance with them, especially as it affects our walk with the Lord and other things that might lead to our walk with the Lord at a later time, to be determined not not to compromise with this Babylonian system. I came up with, and this is not this, most of this is already in your notes, but there's six attitudes that I think are, are really important that we need to have now. And, I, and I'll close with these. Six attitudes we need to come out of all allegiance with Babylon. First one is like I talked about with, about Daniel in chap, Daniel chapter one. Resolve in our heart not to defile ourselves with the Babylonian system. We have to we have to make that 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 decision that I'm not going to even if it, co if it costs me my life, I am not going to compromise with the Babylonian system. Now, you look at Daniel. Daniel was a good citizen. He didn't, like, resist. He wasn't an angry young man. He, was, he didn't resist in those areas where he was, could cooperate with the king. And God, uh, uh, you know, exalted him and anointed him and gave him a leadership, promoted him in his leadership positions. But he, was, he had resolved that he's not going to compromise his walk with the Lord or do things that would lead to the compromise of that, and we have to do the same. Uh, second, be alert 
to discern the motives of those making decrees about a variety of issues. Um, for example, if the World Health Organization gets control over pandemics, you know, my thought is they're probably going to create, manufacture a pandemic, global pandemic, so that they can initiate control over that. We, uh, we don't know that, but we need to be discerning of the motives of what they're doing so that we can kind of prepare ourselves uh, and not just jump in blindly to decisions that seem to be for our good, that seem to be for our benefit, but really are leading us uh, away from our, uh, our strict walk with the Lord and into this Babylonian system. So be alert so as to discern. Third one, do not cooperate or make a decision out of fear. This is really important. We fear God and nothing else. Uh, you know, I mean, with Daniel in chapter 1 or with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in uh, uh, the, a subsequent chapter, you know, they could have said, well, I'm, I'm going to bow down to this idol, but it's, I'm not bowing down in my heart. I'm just not going to do it in my heart. And so that, but that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to not, because they would think, okay, I don't want to die. So out of, uh, out of a fear, I'll go ahead and do it. We don't want to, we don't want to do anything based on fear. We want to, we want to uh, fear God and the fact that we're going to stand before the judgment seat, the fact that we want to be a part of the bride more than we fear doing one of these things that might lead us to compromise our walk and our faith. Fear God and nothing else. Uh, the fourth one is to be a good citizen when possible. Let's not be a generally rebellious person against the, against the system. But we, being a good citizen in those areas where we can cooperate is good, but not cooperating in those areas that would cause us to take a stand uh, that would lead us against our, 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 our faith in, in, tr in the true God. And then the fifth one, we must learn uh, to trust God. We must learn to trust God. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, I'm not sure I can quote it word for word, but the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said this when they were getting ready to be cast into the, uh, into the fiery furnace. They said, we believe God is able. We believe God will. And, and talking about being delivered. We, we believe he's able to deliver us. We believe he will deliver us. But if not, we're not going to turn away from him. They trusted him, God with their life. Now, they were spared, but it does say later in Daniel that not everybody will be. Uh, but it's better... And this is hard, this, you know, none of us know how we react until we're faced with it, if we're ever faced with its decision. But it's better to take the consequences of, of not denying and not deny Christ than to deny him in order to save our life, but then you may forfeit your life in the eternity or certainly a reward. Who knows what all that would lead to. So we have to learn to trust God. And then the sixth one, especially this is for, for forerunners and for those who have insight, uh, be a voice to others. Be a voice to others. You know, once God gives us understanding of these things, let us be a voice to others as well. Um, so those are the six attitudes that we need to come out of allegiance with the Babylonian system. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, we need to come out of her, my people. And I'll read this verse again and we'll close with this. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. We don't want to receive of her plagues. So let's come out.
uh, in the name of Jesus and be that bride made ready. So, Father, we, I, I thank you for the group here and all that will listen to this and watch this. And we pray that you would help us all to resist, to resolve even now, not to participate in any Babylonian move which would lead or would potentially lead to the compromise of our faith or us denying our faith. We want to be that we want to be clothed in fine linen and not be in allegiance to this harlot. So we ask you, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, not only now, but as we go through the remainder of our life, we ask that you would grant us discernment to know which way to walk, faith to trust you in whatever decisions we have to make, to trust you even with our life, and to resolve in our hearts that we, even now, that we will not compromise, that we will not deny you in order to save our life. For Lord, we are familiar with that verse of scripture that he who tries to save his life will lose it. We want to lose our life to you, whatever that may mean. So we ask for the faith for that as we make that decision to come out of Babylon the Great, the mystery Babylon, the harlot, the mother of all harlotries and the mother of all abominations of the earth. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen.